And I'll hand over to you now, Barry. Right. And so <clears throat> let me check. I can immediately start by moving the pictures one after the other and talking and you will be seeing and hearing. Correct. Let's, uh, make a fresh, let's make a start. Uh, that's not a good. Full screen, maybe. Your screen sharing. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes I seem to have a problem. It looks like there's a little option in the bottom left hand corner of your screen to go on to the next slide. Got it. Well right. spotted. I haven't uh, <laughs> used that one before. If you go to Amana with a group or just on your own, the chances are, if you're not over familiar with the site, that one of the main places you visit is the collection of decorated rock tombs towards the northern end of the city, the North Tombs. And in earlier days, you would come by a little tractor and trailer. This is a, quite an old picture, 1992, when we got permission to fly in a helicopter over a mana and take pictures. You go to the foot of the North Tombs and then climb up the long flight of steps to the top. And the first tomb you'll come to is the most, uh, is the most handsome of the tomb, tombs, the one with the greatest amount of decoration in and belong to one of the temple staff at the Great Aten Temple. His name was Mary Ra, and he had the title of Chief of Seers of the Aten. And inside the walls contain extraordinarily detailed pictures of the place where he worked, which to him and to people of the time was the house of the Aten, but in modern times is always referred to as the great Aten temple. And here's a picture of the front of the temple, uh, a pylon with columns and flagpoles with streamers, uh, and the interior filled with offering tables. If you're making a more serious study of the temple, it's actually easier to look at the beautiful and very accurate line drawings of the, of the scenes which were made at the beginning of the 20th century. And here's that same uh, scene, the front part of the Great Aten Temple. Here is Mary Ra leaning forwards uh, respectfully in front of the advancing figures of Akhenaten and Nefertiti and their daughters. It's off the picture to the right. It's a very long picture, matching the fact that the temple itself is a very long, narrow building. And the front has a rather traditional looking uh, pylon with columns supporting uh, an arcade at the front and somehow flagpoles fitted in, being blessed by the Aten itself, the sun disk with the rays coming down, each one ending in a little hand in what looks like a blessings uh, gesture. But beyond that is the first of a series of open courtyards. And this, these pictures help to uh, authenticate the idea that the temple was open to the sky. It's not a traditional temple with a roof. It's open to the sky, very appropriate for the uh, centering one's attention on the Aten and uh, greeting it and paying respects to the Aten with the presentation of huge quantities of food spread out on hundreds, and this is a, a figure you can confirm from the excavation, hundreds of offering tables, a particularly large one here, piled with bread and meat and bouquets of flowers on the top, and then lots and lots of these small ones, some of them seemingly in little side chapels, more bouquets of flowers. And to provide the meat element, there's a slaughter court down here. The temple stood at one end, one side, the north side of what we call in modern times the central city, which was where the main palaces, temples and administrative buildings were. This is uh, a huge, largely stone palace, uh, 
Uh, here's the Great Aten Temple, the house of the Aten, and the smaller temple, which uh, in the time, in the time of uh, Akhenaten was called the mansion of the Aten, but which nowadays is simply the small Aten Temple. And then mud brick buildings rather casually laid out, containing kitchens, there's a huge bakery here, this is a place where cattle were penned, and then administrative offices, including one down here, which is where the Amarna letters were found, the, uh, a center for working on correspondence with foreign rulers from the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, from, from, from the Near East. So it has a, a central place in the city, and the central city was arranged around uh, one straight thoroughfare, you can see it running along here. In modern times, it's been called Royal Road, but that's a, a modern invention. And it runs off to the left, to the north, and uh, after several kilometers, it takes you to the northern end of the city. So this is the main axis of the, of the city. The site has never really been lost on 19th century maps. Uh, the map makers, the surveyors marked the enclosure, although they weren't quite sure what was inside it, but they recognized that it was, was a temple. It took shape and acquired its name, uh, Great Aten Temple, in 1932. This is when the Egypt Exploration Society of Britain carried out uh, an excavation here under the direction of John Pendlebury. Pendlebury was not a man to waste time and hang around. He was full of energy. And it's now astonishing, almost horrifying, that in exactly 30 days, he excavated the entire length of, of the building. And the remains of his excavation are as much as anything in the form of his spoil heaps. They're all along the side here. Uh, he had a little light railway, and these are the, um, not sadly, uh, run by little steam engines, but by his workmen who pushed, uh, they're like trolleys uh, along these embankments. And there's a similar amount of spoil on, on this side. So he's uh, opened up the temple by just collecting up. He had a very large number of workmen and girls. Nowadays, it's not allowed uh, to, uh, it's against the local social customs, mores to em employ young women on, on such a thing. But in his day, you could. So he had a very large labor force, uh, a little railway to help him. And in 30 days, he just cleared everything. And this photograph, it's taken from that helicopter uh, use I, I mentioned, uh, 1932, uh, still shows not only the spoil heaps, the outline of the temple and various other features of significant which belong to the plan of the temple, uh, primarily the open courts, one here, second one here, a third one, and then uh, four, five, and six courts, the fourth, fifth, sixth courts back here. The reason why it looks so flat um, and even inside, I will explain in a moment. You can see that over time, the northern ground beside the temple has become densely covered with modern tombs from the, from the village. And one of the reasons why we started the work here in 2012 was to protect the uh, temple site from further encroachment. According to official Minister of Antiquities survey maps, there is actually an official line along here which separates the uh, ground that belongs to the Minister of Antiquities from the village. But although the end point, an electricity pylon, uh, is marked on the maps, uh, there's no further marker uh, along here. It's, uh, it's a kind of guess thing. And this wasn't uh, really satisfactory enough. And between this photograph being taken and when we started in 2012, all of this area here was filled up with new tombs. And also the site was collecting a large amount of rubbish. So it's also a time to point out that the temple, which was built of, of stone, uh, stood within a, a much bigger enclosure surrounded by a brick wall, which is running along here and vanishes, the, 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 the southern line is off the side of the screen, and an equivalent um, open space on the north, uh, which is covered now by the cemetery. So a very large part of the enclosure has been lost, not just lost, but destroyed by the building of the cemetery. 
One should not be too uh, critical about this. Our own work has shown that people were burying, uh, placing burials in, in the area in the fourth and fifth centuries AD. So the cemetery does actually have a very long, long history, but certainly in, in the last 20 years, um, well, certainly since I started there, the density of graves has hugely increased and they, ha and they have spread. So one of our purposes is to make a much clearer demarcation between the ancient site and uh, the cemetery and hope that the southern part of the enclosure remains uh, undisturbed, remains uh, clearly the protected property of the Ministry of Antiquities. Pendlebury was accompanied by a small group of archaeologists and an architect and an architect. The architect was an Australian, uh, Ralph Lavers. And Lavers had the job within this limited period of time uh, of making a plan at a scale of one to a hundred. I say limited period of time, we have Pendlebury's field diary and immediately he stopped working at the Great Atten Temple. He moved his team of workmen further south and they started another excavation actually in those bakeries that all those administrative buildings. So Labors would have had a very much a deadline to get his plan finished. I'm not quite sure how he managed it actually. Uh, it, it, it's a good plan. Um, we've, what, another thing we're doing, we're re, re-clearing the whole site and making a fresh plan at a much larger scale. And it does help us a lot to have uh, Labour's uh, earlier plan. It is, it is quite faithful to what is there, but uh, it is uh, a little bit generalized. And here, for example, he's marked the northern wall of the temple as if all of the he found all of the blocks there. There's a, a convention here of uh, fine lines, which seems to mark uh, a continuous foundation of stone, stone blocks. But in fact, Pendlebury didn't excavate quite a lot of this. He was worried about finding uh, modern graves uh, as, he, as he thought, and so he left that bit. But Labus nevertheless has given the impression that the entire thing was, uh, was cleared and planned. Uh, so there is a, a degree of generalization in Labour's, Labour's plan. I'll come back to this plan later on because also, there's a key feature here, which we have given much more attention to than Pendlebury ever did. There are in fact two periods of temple. This stone building, which I've come to call the Long Temple, um, and another stone building here, little, little palace, sit on uh, debris, sand and rubble, which is burying a mud floor, which has lots of interesting features on, including this field of about 900 mud brick offering tables. Pendlebury thought they were the same period as the stone temple, but they're not. These were here first, and the stone temple came during uh, Achenaten's reign later on. What Lavers has planned, what Pendlebury un uncovered, was uh, a distinctive method of creating foundations for a stone building. The ground was leveled, and uh, a very shallow pit was dug. The modern surface of the desert here can't be much different from the surface of the desert as it was in Akhenaten's time. So uh, the shallow pit, you can see its shallowness just from the amount that is exposed here. Uh, the ground was, was flattened and a layer of ancient concrete was put down. Now, modern concrete is uh, a mixture of lime cement with aggregate, with pieces of stone. The Egyptians didn't use, the ancient Egyptians didn't use lime much. They used gypsum, which is almost as good and is available in the, uh, in the, in the cliffs, in the desert behind without too much uh, extra work needed. And so they mix the gypsum with pieces of broken stone to make what is uh, very effective concrete. And they spread it over the surface, let it dry, and marked on the surface ink lines where the walls were to go. And they also marked by just chipping into the surface the places where the offering tables would go. So thinking back to the picture with which I started, you've come through the pylon, you're in the first court, it's filled with offering tables, and each one uh, had been uh, laid out on these little square foundations. 
It can be, however, a little bit confusing um, because the floor, this is not the floor of the temple as it was um, when the temple was in use. The floor of the temple was actually more or less at the level of the modern, um, the, the modern uh, desert. And uh, after the builders had put this down, they'd start building up the walls, uh, the pylons, the offering tables with stone, but then it's a bit less than a meter, it gets shallower as it goes back. Uh, they would pack sand around the foundations and then lay the real floor over the top, which would be another a layer of gypsum concrete with limestone paving stones on that. It's a, it's a sort of sandwich that can in places be about a meter thick. When the temple was demolished and probably even more so when it was excavated, most of this sandwich was removed uh, leaving the, uh, the original lowest foundations in place, which is very good for planning the building, <coughs> but it means you, just, you lose the, the, the sense of there being uh, a floor at modern, at modern ground level. And, and we have uh, re-exposed it and planned it uh, again. You see the offering tables and uh, the pylon is just at, down the bottom. Now we have the chance of comparing the modern plans, Labour's plan and our own gradually extending uh, plan at a larger scale. We have a, an opportunity to, to compare them with the pictures in the, in the tombs, not just Mary Ra, but also there's another one, Parnesi, and one or two other tombs, including the royal tomb that has pictures of the temple in use. <laughs> and it's a fairly faithful comparison, but not completely so, you can you start to pick up differences. Uh, for example, here you see little chapels in the, in the uh, first court. The plan I've just shown you is actually this part, part here. There's no trace of little chapels and it's, I think it's very unlikely they were built. This is a piece of uh, artistic uh, license that the, the artists have wanted to make it look busy and intense and have so multiplied the number of little chapels. They did exist in the rear part, so we know what the foundation should look like. And those kind of foundations aren't present at the front. Notice you go through the pylon and you're faced with a staircase and a platform with the pile of offerings on the top. The space that's available for a major construction there is quite small and this puzzled me uh, for a while, but um, near the end of our work at the front, we excavated around the front of the pylon and found this uh, long strip of gypsum concrete, which contains a degree of reinforcement. Pendlebury had exposed it, Labors had planned it, but it's a characteristic of um, was a, uh, not just a mana, a lot of those early plans, uh, you only get two dimensions. You get very little uh, sense of uh, variations in height and thickness. Uh, and so this um, the variation that's here doesn't appear in the, the Pendlebury records. But what you have is uh, a strip of concrete that's thicker than, than, than normal, which contains the stone blocks. And on either side, they look like trenches now, but these are evidently, you can see some of the stone blocks here, these are evidently where a pair of flanking walls ran. And this immediately uh, fits a pattern known from elsewhere at Amana. It's the foundations for a ramp or a staircase flanked with flanking walls, which would have supported carved stone balustrade blocks with the steps rising up, up here. In recent years, we've uh, had a, a, a very valuable contribution from a photogrammetric uh, expert who has a particular interest in the mana, Paul Doherty, and he started to produce uh, reconstruction uh, drawings. And this is one of uh, his, his drawings of that part. When you're looking at the, uh, the, an elevation of the side of that very shallow, long shallow staircase with the platform in the middle, uh, the reddish color of the, uh, the, the upper part of the side, this, th this is to represent uh, the, the balustrade of 
not of limestone blocks, but of carved uh, blocks of hard stone. We don't know exactly which hard stone was used here. It's been made red because a common hard stone used for this kind of thing was quartzite, which has this, this uh, color. And uh, I, I think this is a, a reasonable interpretation of the findings, which of course uh, show that the position, the placing of the, the, uh, the platform and the staircase uh, is, was actually different from the way it's shown in the tombs. And here's another one of Paul's uh, lovely reconstructions. Uh, at sunrise on a day when the sun actually shone down the axis of the temple. And here's a little figure representing Akhenaten. So this is not only an offering place, it is, if you like, uh, an observation platform for sunrise. People get, very, people get very interested in um, astronomy and how it relates to ancient, ancient buildings. This particular picture, it's the reverse, if you like, of the last one. It shows the view that Akhenaten would have seen uh, when standing on the platform on a day when the sun shone very satisfyingly down the axis of the temple. But, but Paul has done some calculations and uh, of course, the sun doesn't rise in the same place along the same uh, line of view every day in the year. And in fact, the day when, or the days when it shines along the axis are the 28th of February or the 12th of October. This is 2018, but it, it's, it's, they would not have been that much difference. And just to bring the point home, uh, as the realities of orientating a building towards sunrise, uh, all, each of these red lines shows the course of sunrise through a complete year. Now, if you uh, orientate a, a building towards the east and a man, in a manner that's towards the, the, the eastern horizon, the, the, the cliffs, uh, it's going to rise in your face every day, but not in an architecturally significant uh, alignment, except on those two days. And it seems to have been uh, enough for uh, Akhenaten that the, the temple offered a place to uh, glorify the, the, the sun at sunrise without any special direction having been given to the temple. Uh, so it doesn't point towards sunrise on the equinox or the, or the solstice. And as far as I know, there isn't really much of any evidence to show that the Egyptians were interested in that kind of, of orientation. Having started uh, the reclearance of the temple, making the fresh plans, uh, and this is a, a, an issue which faces all archeologists. What do you do with the buildings you have exposed? Very often, uh, the, there isn't really a choice. You, you backfill them or you just leave them open to the weather and uh, an uncertain fate. But uh, in this case, um, we, but in fact, it was my decision in the end, I took responsibility for this, uh, decided to mark out the outlines of the building in fresh stone blocks. We had tried this before at the small Atom Temple and were quite pleased with the result, although the resources were less than uh, de desired. In particular, we had trouble getting the right kind of stone, but this time uh, we um, took a, a big decision to order the blocks from uh, the quarries at Tura, just outside Cairo. These are the quarries that uh, produce beautiful, almost grain-free limestone. They were used in, in the building of the pyramids, for example. Uh, they're beautiful and therefore uh, rather expensive. And we started to receive, and since we started in 2012, um, this has happened every year, sometimes more than once, we've received loads of these blocks which are cut to a particular size. Um, Akhenaten's builders chose to have all their stone blocks the same size, which was actually a novelty for uh, large stone buildings in Egypt. They're treated therefore like, like bricks. And each one was one ancient cubit long, that's 52 centimeters, of course, with half that for, for the width. And they have uh, since the, I think the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, attracted uh, the name Talatat. It's an Arabic word meaning uh, three, 
not a discussion as to why that should be so, but that they are uh, accepted as, you know, as, as Talatat blocks. And here they are being unloaded at the site. And the front of the temple is marked out using the, you can see uh, Jura limestone blocks here. The circles are in fact our own version of white uh, concrete, but not using gypsum, using uh, white cement. They're, they're reinforced. They're two and a half meters across. They were big columns. And to uh, illustrate the use of um, hard stone balustrades, these um, slabs have been put in. It's genuine granite from Aswan. Again, rather an expensive choice. They should be about three times as high. But um, if you imagine narrow stone blocks, even though they're really tough, are standing uh, as high as this, they, they do give you the sense of being rather vulnerable to, to accidents. And so we've, we've gone for, for the token. I think it's really quite, quite effective. This is a, a simplified rendering of um, uh, Laver's plan. And the front of the temple is here. Uh, and we, to begin with, concentrated our efforts. And here you've got, so the last picture was taken roughly from here with uh, a circular uh, pad of white cement marking the position of the column and the stairs going up to the position of the uh, offering platform between the pylons. And then the first courtyard with its offering tables. And you can see that the plan of the temple uh, is it centers on a pathway that runs from the front right through to the back. And of course, you have to think of this as being entirely open to the, to the sky. And the offering tables have been treated differently according to uh, whether they're towards the front or the back. Towards the back, as many, it looks as though as many offering tables as, as possible have been squashed into the, the space, leaving just this, this pathway that runs from front to back. But for the first three courtyards, uh, the offering tables cover a considerably reduced area, leaving these uh, spaces around uh, the sides. Are these spaces for access and for access, access to a lot of people? Uh, is this, if you like, a, a people's area and this an exclusive area? One of the things that uh, you have to guess at, uh, and this is true sometimes for brick buildings as well as stone buildings, is where the entrances were. Below a certain level, uh, builders, architects, didn't mark entrances. So the foundations for the stone surrounding walls don't show any entrances, but that's because the entrances would only start to appear at or slightly above ground level. Given the practical problem of access and providing all these, uh, I think there are 750 altogether offering tables within the temple, providing them with, with, with food. If you don't put entrances here, it all has to be brought in from the front, which seems an almost impossible task. Uh, granted that, uh, I've taken the liberty of putting some side entrances in. And then, of course, what I should have done, uh, to revise the, the drawing is to put them along this side as well. Although the, the southern part, this part, uh, is the area where there, there must have been most activity because all the food would have been coming in from the south. But I say this in the end is a guess, although it affects the way in which you uh, see, the, um, see the temple and try to understand it. Having completed work at the, the front with the little granite slabs and the uh, circular column uh, foundations, the column positions, have, having completed that, we then started to let's go back a picture. We then started to build the wall only up to one course, linking the front with the back. This is to honour the, uh, the, the the promise, uh, the um, determination to mark a clear boundary between the temple and the cemetery. So uh, we've put uh, foundations all the way down here. And along about half of it, uh, there's a um, uh, there, there, there's a, a, a capping of Tura blocks. But when we reach, reach the back, this corner here, uh, we then we then started to uh, open up this whole back area uh, with a view, I suppose, if we ever 
keep going that long, or if I ever keep going that long, with, with a view gradually to then joining up the two halves. You can see the density of offering tables and the striking way in which some of them are made more, if you like, select, more special than others by being put inside little rooms. There's a division uh, into two almost identical courts. Why? Is it Achenaten versus Nefertiti or something that is just beyond our uh, comprehension? Uh, and also in the centers of uh, center of each of them, something much larger. And why I think it's granite, I'll show you in a moment. Now at the back, the tomb of Mary Ra and uh, also uh, the tomb of, of Parnesi, which I haven't shown you. The tomb of Mary Ra gives a particularly detailed plan of the back, which does match almost creepily uh, what you see on the, on the ground. Um, it's very useful in that it shows you where the doorways were. And uh, you have to recognize also that it's not 100% uh, faithful. Uh, these rooms contained, we know from the plan, each one contained three offering tables, whereas they've been reduced here to uh, only, only one each. Um, the small rooms uh, also contain only one, not only in the picture, but also uh, from, from the ground plan. Notice that the offering tables are also supplemented with other pieces of ritual equipment, uh, which are stored in little uh, side rooms. For example, here is a little wooden table with, this is a, a broad collar. Uh, and then yes, the, these are, um, they're tall stands that you put offerings on, but instead they actually have lotus flowers uh, draped over the top. And this is another stand supporting a sensor that you would put incense in and wave it about and uh, a ewer for uh, pure, for clear water. Raises a puzzling question. None of this is roofed. These would be metal vessels. Even if they were only copper, they would be valuable. Did they really leave them out in the open? Of course, if they did, they'd start to corrode. If they were gold, they wouldn't, but then they'd be even more um, uh, liable to, to, to theft. And the temple doesn't appear to contain any place for safe storage. They could have collected them all together at the end of the day and taken them off into, it's quite a distance to walk, that central area of storerooms, etc. It's one of many puzzling features, uh, which rather challenge one's, one's common sense. Did they really do this? The question comes up quite regularly. Having uh, cleared it and made a fresh plan, and this is a uh, uh, building up of uh, a new northern wall, having brought it out to the back and made a corner. Uh, we, we've then turned our, our minds to uh, this grand project of building the whole thing up. We have no intention of going any higher than this. It's not just a matter of cost. There are technical and aesthetic reasons why it would be a great mistake to try and take it higher. Uh, for uh, cost reasons, the parts that are not visible um, are made from cheap local limestone blocks. These are blocks which you, you buy by the thousand from passing lorries, literally. Uh, the blocks come from quarries at Minya, which isn't so far away. And as I say, they are quite cheap. <coughs> They're the standard material that people now use for building, building houses in this part of Egypt. But when, they're, um, when they've reached the ancient ground level, then a single course of lovely Tura blocks are placed on top. All this work being done by a little team of builders from, from the village. Uh, when we're not there, they actually are involved in building the, some of the tombs although without the use of spirit levels and uh, um, uh, a theodolite as we use. Um, our builders, um, yes, do all this work uh, for us each time we come. Uh, oh yes, and in, a, in each room, uh, the offering tables are marked out at a slightly lower level and the, the doorways are, are put in. <coughs> B. Uh, I'll show you in a moment what that is. In fact, you've seen it in the last picture. Um, 
Oh yes, it, this is the result of the uh, the builders, uh, the Shahata family, uh, who do the building for us. And uh, once the building is finished, a good deal of sand or rubble has to be put in to build the floor up. The original floors would have been of stone, but it would be quite apart from expensive. Uh, I don't think aesthetically it would work very well to have stone floors as well. So we compromise and the floor is sand. This is rather bright yellow, but very soon it'll have uh, this almost universal color of the, of the desert at Amarna. And here we are, close to the end of uh, work. This photograph was taken, what, about three weeks ago. Um, the spaces here have yet to be filled up with, with, with sand. And next time we're there, we want to then start filling this central part up, which has a, uh, had a special feature. Uh, here it is on the very, very last day. In fact, all the work that had been paid off, they've gone, and that's the final, final photograph. Back to the plan, uh, those two spaces in the center of the fifth and sixth courts um, are filled in the tomb pictures with bigger offering tables, lots and lots of offerings uh, on top. And at first sight, it looks as though these are wooden tables. It looks like a piece of crafted furniture. And of course, it could have been wood covered with gold leaf, for example, Egyptians at this time, as the tomb of Tutankhamun shows, uh, did a lot of woodwork, which was then covered with, with gold. So it could be, could be, it could be that. Um, but in one of the courtyards, there is this granite boulder. Uh, one of the things you discover um, working here uh, is the different weights that pieces of stone have. Different stones uh, have considerably different densities. And one of the densest of all is granite. And a piece like that really is heavy. You need uh, a, number, a group of men to, to, to move it. It's come all the way from Aswan. What is it doing there? It shows up on Pendlebury's, on an aerial photograph of Pendlebury's time. So it's been there for, for a while. It's not something you'd easily move around. And as we've excavated in this area, we've cleared the, um, this is windblown sand that's come in since Pendlebury's day. As we've worked, particularly in the spoil heaps on either side, where Pendlebury dumped the material that he was clearing from here, we've encountered quite a number of decorated granite fragments. Not enough not nearly enough to start reconstructing the whole shape, but it's very tempting to see uh, these fragments, uh, which are not all, always flat, but have um, carved shapes on them. Um, it's very te tempting them to see the remains of uh, a larger piece, which has been broken off from here. One of the pieces uh, from the dump just to the right of that picture, just outside the temple, comes from a statue group, a pair of tiny feet. Surely th these are the feet from a princess belonging to a family group of Akhenaten. It's standing, or she was standing on quite a thick base and where her heels are, the granite is starting to rise and there'd be quite a thick uh, panel behind. So it, it would look like a miniature version of the uh, statues which accompany the boundary stealer uh, in the cliffs behind uh, uh, Akhenaten. Was it within a kind of naos, a little cave? How would this fit into uh, an offering table? And of course, you have to remember all the time the very limited amount of space that was here. Most of the space, space was filled with offering tables. Uh, there isn't much space to park extra pieces of statuary. And each time we work, we find more pieces, but um, it's a bit discouraging sometimes to realize just how much has been broken up completely or in some other way has gone. These pieces come from uh, the spoil heaps that uh, are around on the outside. And most years we carry out an excavation into Pendlebury spoil heaps. Uh, there are two reasons for doing it here. One is that uh, the spoil heat consists mainly of sand and rubble, bits of stone. It's very useful to have this as a, a source of filling up the spaces between the offering tables. But 
The spoil heaps also contain uh, broken pieces of sculpture that Pendlebury himself didn't think uh, was worth what was worth worth keeping. And so um, it's very useful to, to, to have this, this material from the spoil heaps where we've excavated them because it'll tell us roughly where the pieces come from. And so pieces found from these four excavation squares are likely to come from somewhere here. And if there are wall blocks, blocks from walls, it's likely that they'll come from these little chambers here. And we haven't, don't have many uh, such, such good pieces. Um, it can be a little bit discouraging working through uh, this to see the intensity of destruction that people meted out to the sculpture of Achenarten stone, stone buildings, uh, beautiful statues and wall slabs of hard stone were pounded to pieces that uh, are mostly you can fit in, into the hand and in the course of doing that a lot of it would have been reduced to powder. And uh, well, this is one of the blocks that comes from uh, the, um, uh, the, those dumps. It's, it's, it's a, a limestone block from an internal corner. Each one of these two faces is decorated. Uh, so it's been rather awkwardly fitted in. This is one face and there was an inscription up here in vertical columns and you can just make out the profile of uh, a princess. So it comes from a family group, but somebody has quite carefully scraped down the surface to obliterate most of the decoration. You can see the edge of the scraping here that the outer part of the face has been removed and has then put um, limestone colored plaster, I think that's the best way of calling it, uh, to fill it in. You can see an area of it here. Um, <coughs> so it's an attempt to obliterate the royal family and accompanying inscriptions. Now, there, there it is. That line marks the corner. And here's the other face. It's an atom ray. I reconstructed it here, where there's been no damage at all. What does this mean? Oh, this is an attempt to, to place it. We don't know how high it was. Uh, we guess at a height of six meters for the wall. Um, this is uh, a scene from uh, a block elsewhere. It's actually from a quartzite balustrade block from Hermopolis across the river, but it gives the right kind of um, setting. There's a tiny princess here. There she is down there. And I put this block part of the way up. But the, um, yes, that's right. but, but the treatment of, of these blocks, and here's uh, the same, same thing again. Uh, a block which has uh, the remains of a vertical inscription which ends um, for the king's wife. So it relates to the royal family and this has been rubbed down even more. The implication is that, well, I, how I interpret this is, is that uh, after Achenaten had died, very quickly uh, a move was, was made to delegitimize him to get rid of him uh, completely, which was of course successful since in later king lists, the entire Amarna uh, succession of kings is, is, is omitted. But the, that same opprobrium did not apply to the cult of the Atom. And it implies that there's a time when the temple continued to be in use, but without uh, figures of uh, the, the, the Achenaten family or all their names um, present. Um, now we know from early finds that that uh, Horam Heb continued to uh, allow the temple to be used. There's a, a block of Horam Heb uh, from Petrie's work. Uh, there's the remains of a small sphinx uh, with Horam Heb's name on it from the sanctuary building at the back. And there's also some, some evidence that the city as a whole continued to have officials living there uh, and a population into the reign of Seti the first. So you're looking at a potentially quite a, a long period of time with perhaps Ramesses the second being the king who started the demolition of the temples on a really big scale. Now, so far, I'm eating into the time <laughs> rapidly. Uh, so far, we've looked at the stone temple. And I said at the beginning that 
Uh, it was built over the remains of an earlier one. In one of our early seasons, uh, in the foundation trench for one of the stone walls, we found uh, a potsherd from the shoulder of an amphora, and it's written, the label is written in hieratic, and it tells us that it contained wine, here's the word irep, wine, and it has a beautifully clear date, oh for more of these, uh, and it tells us that it's regnal year 12, which means that this great stone temple, which may have gone on after Akhenaten uh, died, was only started in his year 12. And it makes you wonder if he ever saw it finished when he, year 17 was his last year of reign. And so we then have to look at a period of several years uh, when something else was on the site. And the first traces of this something else uh, were picked up by Pendlebury and Lavers, all these mud brick offering tables. And the work we've done at the front has gradually revealed more uh, features. It's quite a busy, complicated site. Uh, oh, well, um, yes, I, I did mention that there was a small palace here. Uh, Lavers marks it as an altar, but uh, it's a, a, definitely a small palace. I'll show you why, why I think that. Uh, it had its own gypsum concrete foundation. These little holes uh, help one to understand where the stonework went. When the temple was demolished, the stones were stuck down to the foundation, the concrete foundation, so firmly that they had to use uh, levers to, uh, to, to, to sort of jerk the stones up. And for each stone, they made a little hole uh, which to, to give the lever some purchase. So it's quite a, a valuable uh, addition to our understanding of the, the how the, what the building looked like. And our first piece of rebuilding was in fact, the outlines of the little, this little palace at the front. Why is it a palace? Well, uh, the picture in the tomb of Mary Ra and in Parnesi, both in this particular, uh, this specific uh, location show a small building that uh, is, is not uh, a, a part of the a functioning uh, temple. Uh, it's obviously a, a small palace, it's a little throne. <coughs> the other one actually has a, a window of appearance in it as well. And here it is. Now, in the front of the temple, the separation of the later building, the stone building, from this earlier period uh, is, is very clear. There's about 80 centimeters of uh, difference in, in height, which is filled with rubble that has been deliberately put in. And this rubble has buried a mud floor, quite a thick mud floor. And when we expose it, we are the first people to see it since uh, sometime before year 12 of Akhenaten. <coughs> and as you can see, the surface here is covered with holes, which are post holes for wooden posts. This is a, 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 a mosaic of um, photographs taken with a camera, not so high technology, uh, held on the end of a wooden pole. And we're not allowed to fly drones. Uh, um, civilian people like ourselves are not allowed permission to do that, so we uh, make, make do with what we can. Um, and this is a plan of that surface with <coughs> post holes which clearly uh, delineate a space divided down here, uh, possibly a division here. And uh, there's an area of mud brick foundations here as well. And it's been, been planned and uh, rather surprising irregularity in the spacing of the, of the wooden poles. In this post hole, a number of fragments of painted gypsum plaster were found. Here they are. Took a little while, as you'd say, for the penny to drop as to uh, what the subject matter is. And I discussed it with, uh, with, with colleagues, including uh, one of the keepers from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which has a, a very good Amana collection, and decided in the end that they are figures of foreign captives. And uh, they've been reconstructed uh, using as a model uh, designs on the, uh, it's, it's like a rushwork stool, uh, 
painted from the tomb of Tutankhamun. And here they are, a Nubian with uh, bows that symbol that they are uh, defeated enemies and somebody from Western Asia, from, from Syria, somewhere like that. <coughs> Our pieces come from a Nubian and I've used uh, Tutankhamun's uh, throne pic or seat picture as, as a way of uh, reconstructing where it was. Um, Egyptian art sometimes is lovely for this because it's so formulaic. The artists had certain models and they used them over and over again um, that it, it does make it easier to do reconstructions like this, which you can believe in. And here are, this is one, and this is the other group of fragments. And when completed, this is what you, this is what you have. Now, this is of great significance. Uh, gypsum, it's, it's come from a floor, uh, painted gypsum floors. They're not very common at Amarna, and always they occur in a building where a king was. They mostly occur in palaces. And uh, so um, this, you can just see one of the captives here. Um, <coughs> uh, here's a king seated, or king, Akhenaten seated on the, uh, a throne on a dais, which is partly painted with, with captives. It, it gives you the idea that this is a small palace, in other words, even though it seems unlikely that a small palace would be slightly irregularly built from wooden poles with uh, matting screens in between. That drawing, that reconstruction, and this one uh, is also the work of Paul, Paul Doherty. And here you can see the captives a little bit more clearly. Uh, I hadn't thought of this. He's gone for a curved roof for a part of it. And that's, uh, of course, a very good Egyptian uh, tra architectural tradition. You find it back in the days of, of the Step Pyramid, uh, this, the, the idea of, of matting shrines, which link the, the present to the archaic, to the primeval past. It's, it's full of uh, you know, power and, uh, and, and symbolism to do that. Uh, and so we, we have, we've got this put here. Now, in order to build it, the ground had already been cleared of offering tables. And of course, then it's, uh, the building must have been demolished and filled in with, with rubble. So it would have had only a short life. It's not a permanent building at all. And it's tempting to think that uh, it's a temporary predecessor of the stone palace, which was to come. We haven't been able to look under the stone palace. Uh, it, it's too solidly built to see if there was a predecessor of this uh, underneath it. Now that mud floor can be traced over a very wide area around the, the temple. Uh, the temple is here, in fact, just roughly here, uh, it's, uh, is um, the first court with all those offering tables on. And our builders are putting in the stonework for the north, uh, north wall and uh, uh, we, we've cleared away spoil heaps and a thinner version of the leveling rubble. And here's this beautiful mud floor, also with holes on it. Now there are two kinds of holes. Well, three actually, because these are modern graves, which we haven't uh, dug down uh, into. You've got post holes here from uh, a building. Uh, only half of it is here, the other half, or maybe uh, three quarters, we have no idea how big it is, is, is off underneath spoil heaps, which we hope to investigate uh, in the near future. So it, it's a building of wooden posts. And these are holes where pots have been buried into the, been buried into the ground. Uh, this one in particular has the profile of a well-known um, large storage jar. But what are they for? Um, th th this starts to, uh, if you like, it, it, it contribute to the idea that the outside of the temple, this huge open space, wasn't just uh, a bleak, empty space, that uh, people came for a variety of purposes. It's acting as uh, an extra communal space for the city as a whole. But whether, they, whether it's like a medieval fairground or not, uh, as yet, we, we, uh, we don't have enough evidence for that. But it, it's starting to point towards another subject matter of investigation another area of supplementary activity to all of the business of worshipping the, worshiping the utter. So that picture was, uh, that building with post holes were here. On this side, 
the uh, aerial views pick up this, this peculiar pattern, which looks like uh, a waffle, a waffle grid. Uh, this is where those mud brick offering tables were. And the reason why you can still see them today is that in 1932, when Pendleby was working uh, here, uh, once you've worked out the distances between the, each offering table, you can then mark it out on the ground and dig a hole to prove, yes, there is actually one there. And these holes are the remains of uh, Pendlebury's uh, trial pits to, to work out how many um, offering tables that there were. And it still shows up. This, we have often used hot air balloons or helium balloons to take pictures. And uh, you can see part of that pattern here. Here it's been disturbed probably by a different, by a more a vigorous kind of excavation. It may be petri. And then these are Pendlebury's spoil heaps, which of course have, have uh, preserved, uh, preserved the ground perhaps better than over here. And this is where the temple is. That's the south wall of the temple, uh, an area part we haven't uh, investigated. In 2020, uh, we did start to work in this area. Here's one of Pendleby's spoil heaps. It's already taken, I think, at least two seasons uh, to excavate it. And a, a lot of pieces of uh, broken sculpture came from it. Come down onto the mud floor, very well preserved, uh, in that it hasn't been broken up, but not so well preserved. It's very worn. People have been using this uh, in, uh, in Achenarten's time. And then it's been buried either by the rubble that we find around the front or by sand. It looks as though they ran out of, of rubble and started to just throw sand down to uh, even the ground up and to bury the traces of this earlier phase of use. And here are mud brick offering tables, quite well preserved. Presumably they were never much higher than this. Uh, and without any, they, they have been uh, painted white, but there's no molding on them. No, no uh, signs of other paint. Uh, the archaeologist who's kneeling here is working on another offering table, but this one was of stone because there's a mixture of mud brick and stone offering tables. And if we ever have, have the time resources in the trench should be continued for to, to run right across the full width of the, um, the, the field of mud brick offering tables. And here's another area where the offering tables are preserved as well as the foundations for three stone ones. And the reason why um, that archaeologist was kneeling down at ground level is whilst the mud brick offering tables were, were just left when they were buried, they didn't want to miss the chance of reusing the stones. Stones are valuable. And so wherever we found uh, stone offering tables on this early mud floor, the, the stones had been removed before they were buried. Notice that they're, they're relatively um, small, um, very hastily built. Um, they, they're not always quite rectangular, although the spacings are, are correct. And here's a plan. Uh, this is where the, that little palace was, the little wooden palace was. The um, mudbrick offering tables have been room, removed. The site has been cleared to make way for this. But otherwise, um, the brownish ones, the ready brown ones on mud brick, the blue ones are stone, so quite a number of stone offering tables, as well as <coughs> mud brick ones. This is the uh, wall of the temple enclosure. As the men were working, uh, there's lots and lots of rubble. It's often quite powdery, but lots, quite a lot also of a complete or broken bricks, they're, they're piled to one side, and it's not really feasible to look at every, oops, at every piece of rubble carefully. Uh, um, but um, sharp-eyed workmen did pick out two bricks which have hieratic written on them. Uh, why didn't we spot them when they were being excavated? But that's, uh, not, not, that's life. Um, and when we find hieratic, we send them, we send copies, send photographs to a French Egyptologist, Marc Gabold, University of Montpellier, and uh, who very quickly then uh, transcribes them and gives us translations and, and commentaries. And this is, this is one of them. When you look at them, you realize that the, the, the inscription has been put on when the brick was in place, just the way it's, you'd hold it. Uh, so this must have been visible. It's a way of marking 
well, we assume it comes from the offering table, although you can't even prove that. And then here's the, the copy of it. And now Mark produced actually three translations because you can't be absolutely sure of the interpretation of all of the hieratic signs. I've chosen um, the most optimistic of his um, translations, the one that makes you think most, you can relate to it. Uh, it this is possibility is that it says the shrine of Parnesi. Of course, Parnesi was one of the chief priests, but it was not a, an uncommon name. But does this then mean this is the owner of <coughs> the um, one of the offering tables and that we have the hieroglyphic word here, here for it? But as I say, it's only one of three possibilities, although the name is likely for, for all of them. Um, I think one of them is the Asiatic. Um, so, oops, nervous fingers. Uh, it it um, opens up the possibility, I said, the, the, the whole outer part of, of the temple does it invite the interpretation that it's there to serve a public benefit, that people came, came in to use it. Uh, does this mean also that they reserve their own offering tables? If this man is Parnexi, had he reserved 20? Uh, is, is his name there because he built them? No, you can't really be, be sure. Um, but it, it, it looks like a, a, a case of private state enterprise uh, mixing, mixing together. So that's one thing that's on the mud floor. Uh, another uh, feature on the mud floor at both levels, the early and the later one, is a series of little platforms of mud brick uh, with uh, like a little moat or series of basins around them. The whole, in each case, the whole thing uh, thickly covered with white gypsum plaster, although it often shows a lot of traces of wear and distortion uh, as if a lot of water has been, uh, have been around, which has caused the, uh, the, the floor to warp somewhat. <coughs> and they were regularly repaired, or it's not really a repair, it's uh, um, uh, or renovated. Although where you can see the earlier layers, they don't seem to be damaged. So perhaps it's a, a regular annual process of um, re restoring them. This one is, I think, it's the only case where the uh, floor of the little trough is unbroken. But most of them, most of them, the, the floor is divided by little wooden, little, sorry, mud, mud brick causeways, um, which, which divide the, the trough into uh, basins. Now, this one has been, the work, work has been stopped on a renovation, presumably when the temple went out of use. It's been uh, it's been stopped halfway through a renovation when, for some reason or another, they wanted to change the, uh, the places where the <coughs> dividers were. So this is a divider which has been removed and another one has been put in here. And you can see very clearly here that there were dividers have been removed and then uh, replaced. And, and so the ground is very distorted. <coughs> the Penbury excavation rather unfortunately dug a trench along, this is the, uh, a wall which belongs to a, a, a temporary construction, which has broken therefore the connection between the mud floor and the, uh, well, a surface which would have run up to the, uh, to the pylon. So we've lost a little bit, but you can see that this area, which is just outside where the basins are, uh, has been particularly busy, the, the, the floor, the ground is distorted. It has little holes in. This looks like uh, holes where perhaps uh, a wooden table has been set in place in mud that's damp and so has sunk a little bit. Uh, you have to take my word for it. This is a little patch of gypsum with impressions of a limestone block. Is this from an offering table? <clears throat> what is the whole thing for? Well, another piece of evidence that came, we re-cleared it uh, for a second time and picked up more details. Uh, one of the um, sets of troughs is just over on the, on the right. Uh, this looks like marks left by runners of a sledge that's been dragged along, or at least something heavy 
with um, you know, parallel um, projections has been dragged along the ground. Oh, and uh, they all come from the second phase. This is the early phase, the original mud floor, and here's another one, and there are others, although the axis of alignment is at right angles to the, to the first. The only uh, handle I've been able to get on this, they're from um, tomb pictures from the late 18th, early 19th dynasty. Uh, there are several of funerary gardens showing funerals taking place, but in uh, a landscape that's much, much bigger than the one we have. <coughs> uh, it includes a lake with real boats on it and real fish and an island and uh, a mummy form figure, either a, a coffin or perhaps just a straight mummy of uh, a deceased person being purified with, with, with water. And surrounding it are trees and uh, in some of them there, yes, you are offering tables. And also uh, offering tables of wood and uh, solid ones and little, little um, canopies are, are over. Is what we have here a miniaturized version of such a funerary garden? That's just, just an idea that floats around until a better one comes up. So this is a, a final look at the uh, Great Aten Temple, uh, the stone building, which was there only after all of this had been buried, here are these offering tables, but uh, for much of the space within the uh, Great Aten Temple enclosure, here's the enclosure wall coming down here, which has never actually been exposed by, by excavation. Uh, outside uh, areas where there are visible features on the surface. There's this huge empty space, uh, which now attracts more than it did when we started, which attracts the idea of careful excavation to find traces of ephemeral structures. It's not completely blank. There are patches of sherds and features like this. It's not clear what this is. It, was a, it looks like a mound of sand that has been dug into by uh, early, uh, early archaeologists. So uh, we're now, we're, we're not abandoning that the main reason why we went there, but we're now supplementing our work by careful, shallow uh, examination of the, uh, of the ground all the way around the temple where it's um, uh, accessible uh, to try and answer the question, what was all this open space for? Is there enough archaeology? Is there enough debris? to lead us on a path of understanding. And that brings me to the, to the end, except an appeal, if you would like to sponsor a block for the temple. This is how we fund it, all these lovely um, uh, Talatat blocks from Tura. Um, when they first arrive, they're white. They, they almost look edible as if they're cheese. And it's a very, very fine. I can see why the Egyptians like, like to use them for pyramids. Uh, it's, it's a very attractive stone, but it comes at a cost. And so uh, it's an easy way of uh, helping us to continue with, with the work. Well, thank you very much for your patience and attention. <laughs> I say that because I can't see, there are a few names here that suggest there still are people, but that's all I know. It's one of the fun we things. We haven't lost anyone yet, Barry, so oh, right. Um, no, all right. <laughs> it, it can be discouraging if you're lecturing to a hall and after about 10 or 15 minutes, people usually towards the back get up and start to leave. <laughs> no, we've, uh, you've, you've maintained nearly everyone here, I think. So we're doing all right. Thank you very much, Barry. That was very interesting. Um, there's quite a few questions. So I will start to go through them. Um, let me see. Da, da, da. Uh, Angela asked uh, what the little stone palace at the north might have been for, but you've kind of covered that, I think. Um, well, I point to parallels. <clears throat> All of the mortuary temples after the end of the 18th dynasty at Western Thebes have little palaces uh, with a window of appearance. Uh, the difference being that they were built of mud brick, not of stone, but the, the parallel for the existence of a small palace where presumably the king would spend a short amount of time in privacy. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the, the parallel I would cite. Uh, Claudia mentioned the uh, presence of the broad collar on the offering tables and um, 
uh, sort of mention the fact that was there any human divine representation in um, Akhetaten or was this, is the broad collar to be considered quite, quite an unusual offering given that it was a temple to the Aten? Oh, um, yes, it's a bit, I find it a bit odd that it's in the temple. If you look at the rock tombs at Amarna where they show the, the palace, uh, there are pictures of Akhenaten's bedroom and it's, his bed is surrounded by little tables and some of them have um, broad collars on, plus food, like a, as if it's a midnight snack. Um, but no, there are no, no human-like divine figures at Amarna other than small amulets, which uh, people could, could wear. They, they're, they're obviously not, not forbidden. Uh, the two popular ones was the, uh, the little god Bess, and um, the goddess Tarweret, they're, they're not really human, they're semi-human. Um, so they, they would be the human amulets? Yeah, well, yes, yes, they're, oh. they're, they're, they're traditional amulets, yeah. which, which would protect people. Uh, there's not much, if anything, visible in um, knowledge of the atom, which uh, points to protection. But in the hymn to the atom, when night falls, it's not a very comforting place to be, but there's no reference to evil spirits. In Egyptian, there's a lot of literature about this. Uh, one of the dangers of night was that the dead, spirits of the dead, malevolent spirits of the dead would start to spread through the city, through houses, and you'd need spells for that. Um, so I guess that's why Bez and Tuareg would have been the, the, the ones that people would have held on to because they were associated with protection during... Oh, the yes, 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 yes. The atom's a bit thin on protection. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Martin asks, um, what happened to all the food that would have been left on the offering tables? Would it have been consumed by temple personnel or would it be given to um, ordinary people in the city? Well, the tra tradition in, in Egypt with uh, particularly large temples was that the food was a token of it would be presented to the god and then it and, and all the rest of it would be paid out to temple staff and presumably there was a big list of people who had an entitlement and it makes one think therefore that Akhenaten is taking it one step further that a very large amount of food is going to be distributed and Egypt being a bureaucratic society, doubtless there, there would have been lists and people would have uh, argued about who's on the list. Now the quantity of food that's being produced in the central city, particularly the huge bakeries to, to the south, implies that there would be an awful lot of it. But of course you can't tell how often the offering tables would have been filled or if the, uh, the supply uh, organization, the supply administration, was up to providing enough food for a regular handout. And of course, you then have to think of the evidence for quite a lot of the people buried in the, in the cemeteries, uh, not only uh, giving, having, having to suffer from too much heavy work, but having an inadequate diet. Mm. Uh, you could then move on to say, well, yes, this was Akhenaten's intention to um, use the temple as, as a means of supporting of the people in his city, but the disruption to supplies that was created by uh, the, uh, the, you know, the creation of this city with its own administration uh, rather spoilt the intention. So you think it was um, like a bit socialist, perhaps, like a sharing well, of that, uh, resources? Yes, I mean, that, that element of the state seeing that it had the job of providing for people. I think it was very widespread in, in the past. Um, the idea of socialism was, of course, uh, a long, long way in the future, but the practice was in fact, was in fact there. Mm. Uh, uh, um, let's see. I once got it, it wasn't me, it was, the, the, the first anthropologist working on the skeletons and myself gave a joint lecture 
No, it wasn't that. It, 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 we made a, we were part of a BBC documentary, that's right, which brought up the poor condition of the, of the workers. And this led to an argument with Dr. Zahi, who was adamant that this must be a wrong interpretation because Pharaoh had the responsibility to look after his people and would not have allowed people to exist in a state of semi-starvation. And that's a good point to make. And so we then agreed to give a lecture to, um, to one of the regular lectures that's held in, in Cairo, uh, developing the theme that uh, the, the problem for the city was that it was a new administration and that whilst the, uh, the intention was there, the ideal was there in, in Akhenaten's mind to support the people, um, all the disruption that went with the creation of a new city and who knows what other problems arose in Akhenaten, uh, from what Akhenaten did, uh, that, 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 the, 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 that the ideal couldn't really be followed, that it didn't work as well as intended. So you, do you think, does that mean that um, where they might ordinarily have got deliveries from elsewhere in Egypt, perhaps they weren't perhaps getting as much, they're a bit cut off? Yes, um, I mean, the, the, some of the people in the cemetery are also suffering a lot from overwork and you get the impression that they are a low, they're low in the social scale, that they, they don't have access to many resources, their burials are very, are very simple and so, and it could be that the elite got more I and mean, that's often the case in societies, well that's always the case in societies, that those who uh, have resources attract more resources and those who are at the bottom uh, don't attract much, much at all. And we're very much at the beginning in Egyptology and ancient studies generally of uh, getting a, a better grip on this, uh, particularly on the concept of, of poverty in ancient Egypt uh, or poverty in ancient societies uh, as a whole. What did it mean? How did it manifest itself? There seems to be a kind of um, artistic, um, a lot of artistic representations of botanical scenes and uh, lots of plants and animals and fish and birds and things. Was, do you think there's an element of wishful thinking in that, that there was actually not as many resources? Uh, uh, oh, well, so, some of the scenes um, in palace co context um, rather emphasize the concept, the idea of abundance of food. It's not just the living things, but uh, tables in palaces heaped with food. Uh, mm. There's a sense that the king, well, again, it's the king, it's the palace living in a, a state of, <coughs> uh, of abundance. Um, and ideals are always, I suppose, going to be uh, in, in part wishful, wishful thinking. Uh, but this is, is one of the challenges now facing uh, humanistic studies of, of, of the past to, come closer to the reality for most people or the, the range of realities across society, uh, given that a majority would be relatively poor. Mm. I was wondering how the kind of density of offering tables in um, uh, Akhetaten compare to other sites. Is there a lot more offering tables there than you would expect to see in other temples? I don't know of any comparable uh, excavation report, any comparable uh, site for the Amarna temples. Now they ought to be comparable to <coughs> Akhenaten's temples at Karnak, but whilst we have huge numbers of blocks from, from the walls, very little that makes sense has been recovered from excavation on the, on the site, so we don't have a ground plan of um, the, the Aten temples at, at Karnak that answers that, that question. Mm. Um, no, uh, the offerings in conventional temples, think of Medina Tabu, a very well preserved one. Uh, were, the offerings were made before a number of statues of gods, but the space, the surrounding space is relatively small, and particularly the space where the food would sit would be very small. Uh, and yet there are calendars of offerings, quite, quite a lot of material uh, there, quite large quantities. And one, one has to assume that what is presented to the gods 
uh, is just a token and that the rest of it is sitting in storerooms and people will be queuing up outside with their little scrap of paper, which gives them an entitlement to receive something from the, from the temple. And they may have had uh, a, a job, you know, some token job. And you, you mentioned, is this an early form of socialism? It, it, you get the impression also, and some of the sources are fairly explicit about this, that there was a deliberate a multiplication of jobs, which was done by employing people for part of the year, uh, so that more people would get entitlement than if people were employed, uh, if a smaller number of people were employed for uh, permanently uh, through the year. Do you think there, there might be any correspondences with uh, the number of offering tables and say something like the days in the year or some sort of cal calendrical system? Oh, that, that has been investigated. Um, an Egyptian uh, architect, Alexander Badawi, uh, tried to calculate this using the number of, it's nine, well, Pendlebury's number isn't uh, consistent, but it's just over 900 offering tables. But we now know from our work that the offering tables spread around the front of the temple and some are on the north. So even the number of, of offering tables is not uh, certainly fixed. And it gives you whatever it was, it's a different number to the stone offering tables that were put into the stone building, which is about 750. Mm. People have also suggested perhaps they represent individual towns and cities in Egypt. Um, it seems to me that, that that's a bit implausible, um, but, but you, know, you can't tell. There's, you can't disprove it and uh, you certainly can't prove it. So um, you were mentioning earlier the earliest signs of any kind of building on the site. Was um, Akhenaten return, like spiritually, was there an, an idea that he was returning to this original site? No, um, it's, it's a new site, that's emphasized. It's a site <clears throat> that does not belong to any god or goddess, uh, to any king, uh, to any person. It's, it's a virgin site. And to qualify for that, it had to be a piece of desert. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, there's emphasis also on the, the Eastern horizon. And the way I imagine, but it's only uh, my imagination, the, the way I imagine it being chosen every year until Akhenaten's uh, time in the New Kingdom, uh, kings were living at Memphis. That was their, their, their main base. And once a year they would travel in a great convoy of boats to Thebes for the festival of Opet. And so you have, you have to imagine Akhenaten cruising slowly up the Nile and having a, you know, an, an opportunity to look at the, at the Eastern desert and, and look at suitable places. And uh, once you start to look at a map of where things have been found, you realize that there aren't that number of places like Amarna, a nice spread of flat deserts surrounded by the cliffs with nice little wadi entrances, which help you to see the, the hieroglyph Achet horizon. There aren't that number to choose from. Uh, and it may have been as much by a process of, of elimination, perhaps also encouraged by a wish to be halfway between uh, uh, Luxor and, uh, and Cairo, between, sorry, between Luxor and Memphis, Thebes mm -hmm. and Memphis. It may have been a process like that. And uh, not to imagine a moment of revelation. Gosh, yes, that's the one. It's, it's just right. And mm. in a way, it, it was. And we, we think of Amarna as essentially the city with tombs and bits and pieces out in the desert. But the way um, the boundary stele of Frey suggests that the heart of Amarna, of, of Achetata in the name, was actually the, the cliffs and the piece of desert in front of it which mm. kept clear of buildings, except for the workman's village and stone village, but they were rather separate. <coughs> Is there an idea of him returning to, I mean, essentially, you think he established the first monotheistic type of religion. He was trying to stop worship of other gods or goddesses and just focus on the Aten. Uh, was that seen as a return to some much earlier religion than the later Amun priesthood mm. and things like that? Well, certainly um, he wanted to obliterate the existence of the god Amun and perhaps some of the other uh, deities, particularly Mut, that, that was 
part of the, if you like, the, the Amun family. But for the rest of it, the evidence for closure of temples or destruction of the temples is actually quite hard to find. And there are acres of carved stonework from uh, temples from before Akhenaten, which show no trace of uh, damage unless there happens to be an Amun figure there. So he wasn't mm -hmm. quite the fanatical iconoclast that he's often made out to be. Okay, great. Um, Claudia asks, might the amount of altars and tables indicate that this was designed for the public to make offerings? Is there any evidence of any other temple that might have been used by the royal family only? Were there any auxiliary priests? I recall seeing in one of the first slides the figure of a man, a priest, holding a censer. Thank oh, you. Yes. Yes, that, well, there was the smaller Aten temple, although that has lots of offering tables. But there were a number of um, other buildings for the royal family which fall really between the category of temple and, and palace. Uh, they're all of them dedicated to or given ownership uh, of uh, a royal female. So there's one for Queen T, one for Nefertiti, one for some of the daughters. Um, I don't know whether that would answer your, your question, um, that there wasn't quite such a sharp distinction between temple and palace as uh, nowadays one is encouraged to, to, to believe. Uh, now, at, at Karnak, a very large number of blocks that have been recovered um, provide lists of officials uh, of the court, including priests, but we don't have comparable evidence for Amana. Uh, so we know the names of a very few people who uh, had positions in the temple, but that doesn't mean to say that they weren't actually a very large number of them. Uh, that it just so happens that they haven't been recorded in uh, collections of blocks taken from, uh, taken from the demolished temples. That may just be an accident. Uh... Yeah, asks, are the nearby villagers aware and convinced of the importance of preserving the remains of the Great Temple and the rest of Akhetaten, or is there a fight between each other? <laughs> um, it, it varies according to, to, to people. Um, the level of education in Egypt has steadily been rising. Uh, the, the government promotes an interest in its ancient uh, past particularly now under the, under the current president, uh, there's an attempt to make Egyptians feel proud of being part of a society that has very, very deep roots and masses of achievement in the past. But of course, a lot of the villagers uh, are struggling for, for survival, although they know that tourism is a bit of a boost, but the, the, the volume of tourists at Amarna is not really very great. It's not a significant co contribution to uh, to, to income. Um, the, 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 the conflict that is quite often present uh, uh, is um, encroachment of land. And the present government has, has come down very, very hard on this, not just encroachment on antiquities land, but government owned land. Uh, at times when the administration becomes a bit slack, as happened after the 2011 uh, re revolution, people take advantage of this to build houses on government land, maybe land belonging to the Ministry of Irrigation. At Amana, it, it's taking antiquities land for farming. Uh, the counter to this uh, are the inspectors and the um, tourist and antiquities police. Such struggles that happen take place mainly in the courts. Uh, the, the inspectors have their own sources of information, mainly the guards that are employed. And if they uh, find uh, a family, an individual who's been taking land for cultivation, then they will go to the court. But of course, very often the farmers, they're not all poor people. Some of them can afford lawyers or maybe politically connected. And so uh, the, the struggle takes place in, in court with documents. And sometimes the uh, antiquities organization organization wins, sometimes it doesn't. But currently, as I say, the, uh, the current president of, e of Egypt uh, and, and the parliament 
uh, have really been bringing a crackdown on people who've been building illegally and taking agricultural land uh, for, for, for building and taking uh, antiquities sites. So at the moment, the good is, uh, is, is uh, coming to the fore, it's winning. Great. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because I was saying to uh, Barry before we went live, is I was watching your talk that you did for um, the study of ancient Egypt, was it? It was um, about it's gardens. In, gardens. It's in De yes, in Denver, Colorado. It's the yeah, uh, Egyptian Studies Association. That's right. Um, I was wondering whether you know of any attempts, because some of the, the paintings or the drawings or the illustrations of gardens at Amarna look really beautiful. I was wondering if you know of any attempts uh, to recreate a garden um, in an ancient Egyptian style using some of the plants that you know they would have used. If so, I'm not sure that I would encounter it. Um, one thing I can say is that there have been and I showed one or two pictures of this, there have been successful attempts by botanists to recreate garlands, you know, things you put around your neck. Uh, there's one or two in Tutankhamun's tomb or around a, a statue using the actual plants, them, plants themselves. Um, as for growing, I, I don't know of anybody who's done that, but I'm not sure that I would be aware of it. If they do. I, I love the idea of that. I think that that would that would really uh, jazz up an ancient Egyptian site, <laughs> and maybe create a bit of shade eventually. I know my friend Merva, who runs New Homopolis in the middle of Egypt. Oh yes, yes, yes. She's uh, she's making a beautiful kind of garden there and uh, growing lots of plants. Oh, well, there you are. That's the answer yeah. to the question. Yeah. <laughs> and she's growing a blue water lily as well, which I think is actually oh, yeah. quite rare now in Egypt. So that's, yes, that's, right. it that's is. Not nice. <clears throat> um, let's see what else. Um, would anyone like to ask their own question? Because actually, there's a big. Um, Would anyone like to unmute themselves and ask their own question? I'd like to ask about Queen Tai or T. Um, I've read one that she didn't come to Armana in one account and in another that she was indeed very much present. Yes, um, the evidence, the idea that she came to Armana, whether on a visit or to live, comes from a scene in one of the rock tombs at, at Amarna where <clears throat> Akhenaten is shown leading her by the hand into a temple he's built for her. Mm. Um, one must remember that at the level of the royal family and I think senior officials generally, people moved about. Yeah. Uh, now in the royal tomb, sorry, in the boundary stele, Akhenaten states uh, that he's talking about the tomb he's making for himself, Nefertiti and Meridatum. He doesn't mention tea, but perhaps the same applied. Uh, he says that if he died when he wasn't at Amarna, then his body should be brought back and buried there, uh, implying that he, and the same applies to Nefertiti and uh, the eldest daughter Meridatta, implying that they were that they envisaged their future would be not staying all the time at Amarna, but moving about. Yeah. And it could be that uh, Queen T was the same. And one's encouraged to think that by it's one or two of the Amarna letters um, in, in which the, the writer refers to uh, Queen T as somebody whose advice Akhenaten li listens to. Yeah. They never, they never mentioned Nefertiti, but, but Queen T was a person who impressed people. And yeah. it's very likely that she was buried in the royal tomb of Amarna, yeah. even though she's not mentioned on the boundary stealer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question concerning the temples. I'm really fascinated. I think this is absolutely, it's blowing my mind away. Thank you for giving this lecture. I, I am impressed that the temple looks so perfect. So the architects and the builders came from Luxor or Thebes because this is not something that anyone can learn. So they came already with the knowledge. And I'm surprised that they didn't keep a little bit more of the change and dimensions of the rooms, as like in Karnak, where the floor rises and the, the rooms become a little bit smaller, just to give this kind of um, uh, secrecy. I know that there are no roofs, so it's not going to get any darker. Yes, um, 
And this is a period when major projects, major building projects were being undertaken throughout the country, including Nubia. So there must have been uh, quite a body of skilled architects, <clears throat> but perhaps he did um, bring some builders from, um, from Luxor, from Thebes. Um, you, can't, you can't tell. Um, hmm. And across the river at uh, the site of Hermopolis, El Ashmonaim, yeah. there, there was the place where traditional temples were built. And of course, a lot of the Amarna blocks finished up there afterwards right. in buildings for Horemheb and um, <coughs> Ramesses, Ramesses II. The design of the great Aten temple, the proportions, I don't think it, there, there are parallels to it. But you must also remember that the main temple to Ra Hurakhti, Ra Hurakhti is more or less a synonym to, to the Aten. The main temple to Ra Hurakhti at Heliopolis, mm -hmm. uh, it has never been uncovered. The, the site is known, but it's, it is very heavily covered, very deeply covered with later ancient structures, with modern housing estates, with, with, with lots of rubbish, debris. And uh, also <clears throat> the, early, the earlier temple uh, ground level is below the water table. So we may never in the, in, the, in the foreseeable future know what the plan of the sun temple at Heliopolis was at this time. Yeah. Uh, I am Egyptian by birth and um, I worked as a guide for about 11 years uh, the first time I visited the Amarna was in 77. And I'll tell you, it looked nothing like what I've seen today. Um, and I worked on the Hilton boat. And Hilton was one of maybe two cruise ships that did the long cruise and stopped at Dendera, Edfu, and so on. And I think part of the highlight was more meeting Umm Seti. Oh, yes. You know, maybe <clears throat> yes. Because at... Um, Achitatun, there was a stila that the cars couldn't take us any close to it, and it was a military area. And all what we did, we got the tractor and we went to where the, the tombs were, and there was nothing else. We did Ashmonin, of course, and sometimes yes. <clears throat> and so on. This is just absolutely fascinating. Uh, and the 40, 50 years that passed, uh, how much excavation has been done. Well, and also steps to improve access as well <clears throat> and, and look after the site. And 1977 um, was my second year of survey at Amarna. Okay. And it was around about that time that I myself was also on the kind of cruise you, you, you refer to. So we um, may have met without knowing it. We might indeed have done it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Now, I remember the tractor. And they were tundra like trailers that they would. Yes, they were. Yes. Yes. I can oh, see. Great. Did both of you meet Omseti then as well? I, I did meet Omseti several times. Mm. Um, How about yeah, you, Barry? She was well, something <clears throat> that I said. Before, I, before I worked at the Mana, uh, I did two seasons with the Pennsylvania Yale expedition to Abydos, to Abydos. And so I saw a lot of Omseti. <laughs> and what did you think of Omseti's um, past lives? Oh. Uh, bewilderment. Um, she, she lived, she existed in two worlds. Um, she would talk about, because she lived in, in the village and was looked after by, uh, he was a kafir of the water tower, so a very ordinary man. And uh, she was a, uh, an entertaining source of village gossip. And then suddenly she'd switch into how that morning she'd gone into the temple and uh, she was back in the time of Seti the First and uh, you know, was describing things, you know, visionary things that she'd seen. And then would switch back uh, all in, in, in the same very English voice that she had. Yeah. What did you think of her visions? Did they match up with your ideas? I'm not very sensitive to that kind of approach to existence, but I, uh, I, I realize the fault is probably mine. <laughs> uh, if I may add, she believed what she was talking about, whether oh, yes. it was true to Absolutely. us or not. Oh, she yes. 
it was real for her. And she was a very well-read woman and very highly educated. I mean, maybe the notion that she had was from her studies and maybe she had a previous life. I mean, I, I cannot see the difference and why not? Why yeah, not? that's all I can say, why not? It's just yeah. something that I can't, I find myself unable to enter into uh, sort of serious engagement with that, that, that approach. Hers is such a fascinating story. Didn't she have like a near-death experience when she was a little girl? That's where she's yes, that's right, yeah. yes, yes, yes. information from. That's and then when she came back, she ran into the British Museum, I think, and was like, I found my people, and then yeah, studied yeah. it for the rest of her life. Yeah. Amazing. Um, but she also worked as uh, an employee of the, the then antiquity service. Mm. Working in the excavations of private tombs at Giza. And by the time I, I uh, met her, um, she was retired and so living on a tiny pension from the government for that, those years of service. But that would have brought her into contact with um, professional Egyptologists and libraries and so on. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder because she was, um, she could read hieroglyphs, couldn't she? Yes. And, yes. Um, I don't know whether that was something spontaneously that came to her. She obviously learned more and more as, as she got older and, and became exposed to more and more information. But um, yeah, I love reading the stories about her. And no matter what anyone thinks about the veracity of her stories, everyone was seems to have really liked her and found her enjoyable company. Yeah, very much so. She worked as an assistant to Salim Hassan, who was really the lead, he was the equivalent in that time of Dr. Zahi Now, he was the, sort of the leading, um, somewhat charismatic um, senior Egyptian archaeologist at that time, like Zahi working at Giza. Mm, excellent. Uh, did she used to sleep in Seti's tomb or something like that as well? I don't know. But I know <laughs> of. In her life, by the time I encountered her, was focused entirely on of Idos and the, the Temple of Seti the First. Yeah. Oh yeah, Claudia just mentioned, I think she um, she apparently gave directions of where people should dig and, and they discovered, uh, I think it was a garden that she was describing. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's have a look at what else we've got. Does anyone else have any other questions that they would like to ask? Uh, may I ask two questions? Mm. Oh, thank you. Well, did Akhenaten, Akhenaten try to reveal sacred secret of religion so he didn't build walls of temple? If so, does this effort related to popular, popularization of piety of the religion in Ramesai period and, and religion in, uh, no, no, not religion, the effort that Chef Seskaf performed in Old Kingdom? And the second question is, it's very interesting that ancient Egypt is related to socialism. Did ancient Egypt have conception of welfare? How did pharaohs and elite class people to take care of poor people? Well, I can answer the second one <clears throat> more easily than I can answer the first. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is starting to go. Ancient Egypt, like modern Egypt, uh, a lot of life focused on families and clans where and there still is a very strong tradition of helping within that group. Um, but in ancient Egypt, it was taken, take, taken further through large scale uh, employment of junior officials. And uh, there's lots of written material about uh, rations that were paid out for performing um, government duties. And I suppose you could say that modern Egypt uh, has, it hasn't recreated it, it may always have been there, um, a, a, a subsidy for basic foods, which leads to a rationing system. And the government is very worried, the Egyptian government is very worried about the consequences of this with a, a still rapidly expanding population. And they're trying to cut back on uh, subsidies, but they, they're still there um, with basic foodstuffs, especially bread. Um, this is not done in the, in the name of socialism. It's, it's seen as 
the right thing for a government to do. As I say, the economic pressures are now making it difficult to maintain. I didn't quite get the first part of the, of the question. Um, can, can, you, can you repeat it? It was about the walls, was it? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for short English. Right. Uh, did Aken Akhenaten try to reveal sacred secret of religion so he didn't build walls of temple? If so, does this, does his effort is related to popularization of piety of, of religion in Ramesside period? And I heard that Shep says Kaf, the old kingdom pharaoh has had built small tomb similar to Aten, similar to great temple of a temple of Aten because it is similar to, is, it is associ associated with Eastern horizon of sun. So I, yeah, that is my question. I don't think I can answer the, the Shepsef, Shepsef's calf part, but the, <clears throat> the popularization of piety in, in Ramesside, Egypt, um, the sources uh, increase greatly um, for many things in Ramesside, Egypt, that the written and pictorial sources are, are greater and they're more accessible to us. But there's a lot of evidence for people's participation in minor cults, really going back to the beginnings of Egyptian history. Um, small shrines which accumulated um, collections of small votive objects. You get the impression that not much wealth is exchanging hands, but uh, people uh, are approaching gods and goddesses for assistance. And if you like paying for it with uh, inexpensive, uh, specially shaped uh, things. Um, one, one of those prominent example of the cults of Hathor. Uh, the goddess Hathor is associated with the colored turquoise, uh, and therefore she's the goddess uh, who has a temple at Sinai. And um, it was thought that anything made of turquoise colored faience would be attractive, would be pleasing to her. And so there are quite a number of collections of votive objects from small Hattel shrines, which concentrate on pieces of faience, maybe objects made of faience or just broken pieces of, of, of faience. Several examples are known from, from the late Middle Kingdom through to the latter part of the 18th dynasty. Um, so I, I think um, it, you, you can't properly claim that there was an increase in numbers of people approaching gods for assistance uh, in, in, in Ramesside times. What the increase is in making it conspicuous, uh, making of offerings which conform to the, the canon of Egyptian art and, and proper inscriptions. Whereas the, this earlier material, it's a bit impenetrable because very often there's nothing written on it. But the numbers might, might have been, been similar. Thank you so much, Barry. I think I should let you go now so you can get your voice back and have a little relax <laughs> yeah. and have some food. And, um, I just want to say thank you so much. It's been okay, a wonderful okay. lecture, a really good in-depth uh, view. Annette, would you like to say a few words yes, on behalf please. of Ramesses? <laughs> yes. Um, on behalf of Ramesses, I'd very much like to thank Barry for giving us his time today and obviously to Sarah again for hosting to us. Um, uh, Ram uh, blah, blah, blah. Amana holds a very little special thing for us at Ramesses. We were due to have Barry come to lecture us um, just before COVID hit in. So obviously he wasn't able to come. And I believe you have been to us previous before. Am I right, Barry? I'm sure I'd seen you. I think you had already given us a lecture once before, I believe. I could be wrong. My brain's not like I it used remember to. remember giving a lecture in Kent. Yes, it, that, that would have been us, yes. So 
Uh, yeah. yeah, so from obviously when Bar when um, Peggy and John Dewey were alive, we were very lucky to come to, on one of our holidays to Egypt that we did. We were very lucky to come to Amarna and oh. had a visit tour around. And from that, the society, we started up bazaars at the our um, lectures and the money raised, we've been putting aside and we're very pleased to say that we do have a donation of a thousand pound for your for your cause, which we will now get our treasurer to sort out with your lady that you have given me an email address well, for. Right. Yes. So so that, treasurer. that was <laughs> that was the reason why we wanted you to come and visit us again. But obviously it hasn't been happened. So this is why we've set up this lecture as a replacement. So. Yeah, we could also let you know that we are letting you have a thousand pounds towards the Amana. And obviously we do get updates in our um, and society newsletter, which you very or your you and your team very kindly give to us. So the society members do keep a you know a vested interest in what is going on and we do thoroughly enjoy it. And obviously one day we hope that we might be able to come back out and have another yeah, visit yeah. but right. thank you very much for today and thank you to everybody for participating on easter saturday it's been a little bit difficult to try and sort logistics out and i know i appreciate it's easter but it's given me a little bit of a rest from decorating today because i'm wallpapering so <laughs> but thank you very much indeed and thank well, you, say to all you thank you very much for all the generous donations uh, <laughs> yes. times are not uh, easy now yeah. So we need all the donations we can attract. Thank, Thank you. you. That's lovely. Right. <laughs> I'm I'm just going to go and answer that phone because my mum my mum I'm at my mum's and uh, oh. thank you ever so much. <laughs> Can I can have a quick word with you about uh, the ticket and if I paid for it or you paid for it. Um um yes well I I will um I've got your email Maha I'll I'll email you after this yeah. there's no rush it's fine. I appreciate that. Have a very happy holiday everybody and happy Easter. Yeah. Oh, yes, happy Easter. Yeah. And thank you again, Barry. This was very informative. Bye. 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 I'll let you all go now. Happy Easter to everybody. Bye bye. See you later, Barry. Thanks so yes, much. Yes, indeed. Yes. Thank I'll you, I'll Barry. Press, I'll press the leave button now. <laughs> Here it goes. Thank yes. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye bye.